Good morning, everyone. We are back out live to Africa this morning. You're looking at Mount Kilimanjaro somewhere behind those clouds over there, but it is that mountain behind those clouds that is helping raise awareness for living kidney donation. Today, we talk with one woman who went to great heights after she helped out a friend's husband, someone she didn't even know, by donating her kidney to him. We're gonna talk to this trio about their forever bond that they now share. Plus, we're gonna chat with Dr. Tim Schmidt. He's the Director of Transplantation here at the Health System about the impact of this climb and how stories like this really do help out the transplant program. The Morning Medical Update starts right now. Good morning to all of you. It is Thursday, March 24th. Thanks for joining us here on Facebook, on YouTube, and of course now on Twitter. In medical headlines this morning, high cholesterol and low blood sugar is in your 30s. It may rise, uh, raise your risk for Alzheimer's disease. This is according to research at Boston University Biomedical Genetics found that those who had high levels of triglyceride, the good cholesterol, were more likely to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease later in life. If they add the connection was not seen for the older age groups, perhaps because older adults are treated for cholesterol more aggressively. A study finds that moms are not passing COVID on to their babies. That's something that we have discussed quite a bit here on this program, but further studies kind of prove this. The article published in BMJ finds less than 2% of babies born to mothers with COVID tested positive around the time of birth. Here might be why you do not get eaten, but you might get eaten alive even though you have the repellent on. You're dousing yourself with repellent and you're still getting eaten by bugs. Researchers from Johns Hopkins Medicine finds that mosquitoes' odor sensing nerve cells shut down when those cells are forced to produce odor related proteins making the bugs able to ignore common insect repellents. Mosquitoes, of course, as we know, can spread diseases like malaria and Zika virus. Get your questions sent in to us on YouTube, Facebook, and the Medical News Network. You can find links to those right there on your screen. Let's get to Dr. Dana Hawkinson this morning, Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control, joining us with our COVID count. Good morning to you. How are you? Good. Good Thursday. Yeah. Uh, we have 15 active infections right now, one in the ICU, uh, none on the ventilator, still 53 in that uh, recovery period. So, you know, again, our cases, uh, uh, the ones we're considering active cases are holding steady in those mid-teens, and we'll kind of uh, keep watching that. We know that overall cases are continuing to go down, even though we're seeing um, a little bit more of a, uh, a switch to the predominance of BA2 circulating around the United States. Right now, we haven't seen a necessarily a surge in cases, so that is a good thing. All right, sounds good. We'll check back in a few. Do we have any reporter questions on the line today? I think we are good. We're going to keep moving on. Every nine minutes, another person is added to the transplant waiting list. That's according to the Health Resources and Services Administration. In fact, take a look at this chart. A majority of people are waiting for a kidney. You can see it shows the patients on the waiting list versus transplants performed in 2021. More than 40,000 people received a transplant nationwide last year. That's a record. Two people who know the impact of a life-saving organ donation are our guests today. Stephanie Meyer donated her kidney to Dan Harmon right here at the health system. This happened four years ago. We want to welcome both of you to the program along with Dan's wife sitting right there by his side. She's really the link that brought these two together. Also by my side is our director of transplantation, Dr. Tim Schmidt with me to kind of sit back and we're gonna answer some questions and you kind of get to look on. I know it's so fun to see our um, your patients after the fact, right? Yeah, it's good to see things when they go well and people have normal lives and continue to do things that they wouldn't have been able to do before. So it's good to see happy endings. Yes, yes, we like that. Okay, so we're gonna get to, get to some questions, but I wanna get to this story. Uh, Katie and Dan, we're, let's start with your Facebook post from several years back. I wanna pull that up so people can see it on the screen. Um, you turned to social media to help find a living kidney donor for Dan. Tell us a little bit about what went into that decision to do that. Well, yeah. So, you know, when the, the you know the time was right to where we need to be placed on the transplant list, and we kind of were going through that process, we originally just intended it to kind of let everyone know, you know, what our journey was going to be uh, like from going forward. Because a lot of people didn't even realize that I was, you know, in a position where I needed to be on a transplant list. And we, so we just kind of wanted to inform everyone what was going to go, you know, happen. And we just kind of you know threw it out there as well that you know it's like if you were interested in. Mm -hmm 
you know, wanting to be tested to see if you could be a match, then we just added that on there as well. Um, and, you know, lo and behold, when that happened, you know, that was overwhelmed by the amount of people who like came forward. I mean, everyone from coworkers, families, you know, friends to even strangers, um, you know, said that they would be willing to like go through the process and uh, see if they were tested for a match. Katie, you were uh, shaking your head. You were surprised when you got this uh, overwhelming response, people wanting to share their spare. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's intimidating to make a Facebook post like that because it feels like such a big ask. And for us, it was more, as Dan said, just informative. We wanted people to know what was happening in our lives. But then to have all of these people reach out that we had no idea would even be willing or interested was just overwhelming and incredible. Then uh, in walks Stephanie, kind of a blast from the past. Um, Stephanie, you and Katie were high school friends. You hadn't seen each other in a while, hadn't really been in touch, right? Okay, we, we do have your pictures pulled up. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I love those pictures. Thank you for oh sharing. <laughs> so, um, so, and you had actually never met Dan before. So, so in essence, Dan was a stranger. Katie was not, mm -hmm. but Dan was. What, what prompted you to, to reach out to them? Absolutely. You know, I uh, saw the Facebook post and community service and giving back has been a huge driving force in my life. I feel like uh, I had a childhood where people stepped in and helped a lot. Uh, and coincidentally, the Facebook post happened to be posted on the same day as the anniversary of the passing of my father. And I tried to do something kind of pay it forward. And I thought like, what a God wink that is to see this post on this day. And uh, Katie was really one of my best friends in high school. And so I thought if there if I had an opportunity to help her, uh, I would love to do that. And of course thought, well, I'm gonna be a match. I'm just gonna donate this kidney, no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that's kind of how you tackle a lot of things in your life, uh, as we've learned <laughs> getting to know you on this program. Uh, Dr. Schmidt, just tell us, first of all, so people understand who are watching a little bit about kidney donation, what living kidney donation entails, a little bit about the program and how it all works. Yeah, I think um, when people become with chronic illness, kidney disease or, or liver disease, it's kind of scary for them. And, and there's like taking information in like a fire hose with an open mouth. Mm -hmm and uh, posting about needing a kidney can be pretty scary because it's people have shame guilt other things that they worry about about asking for help and and most people do not have a lot of a uh, big social support system and they don't have uh, people willing to donate to them so it's it's um i think about 40 to 30 percent of our patients get a living donor so that's really nice because living donors work right away they tend to do well longer and patients can schedule the surgery so all those factors take away the unknown of waiting for two three now sometimes four and five years on the list for another type of donor for the brain dead donor so you know if anybody has the ability to donate and you can see after donation you can still do a normal things have a normal life and uh, you can really help people out uh, who need a kidney. So I, I think it's a great way to help people. And yeah, and, and people like Stephanie are, are definitely living a normal life. We're going to get to that here in a moment because she's just she just did a pretty big thing. So we'll get to that. But Dr. Schmidt, I do want to ask, you know, what's um, talk about dialysis. Do people get on the list and they're trying to wait long enough to where they don't have to go on dialysis? dialysis? Do some people just go on it and they have no choice because they're waiting so long? And what kind of life is that? Yeah, kidney failure, you know, starts slowly and then people end up right before dialysis and then on to dialysis and then they can be on dialysis for a long time. Uh, I, I think Dan, in his case, he did not have to go on to dialysis, which uh, dialysis is often three times a week, three hours at a time. It wears you out. It messes with your fluid status. You can't drink. You can't eat certain things. So dialysis is almost like a full-time job for some people. And a lot of our patients have been on dialysis for three, four, five years before they get a kidney. So it's a pretty rough lifestyle for them. If we can avoid patients going on to dialysis, it saves them a ton of suffering and pain. Yeah, the quality of life yeah. goes way down. I want to pull up some video, though, because uh, this happened four years ago here at the health system. And, and Dr. Schmidt, 
let's go back in time a little bit. <laughs> tell, tell us a little bit about how this all works out. So, you know, you because I think we're going to show some video in the actual OR and how um, you're the one who took, uh, you kind of get the, the kidney kind of tossed over to you, yeah, if you yeah. will, it's like and you the, catch the ball. It's like the Seattle fish market. We just chuck it. Right, like... you just chuck it over <laughs> from one OR to the other. <laughs> there it is coming out. Uh, and with that's Dr. Sean taking it out. Yep, Sean Coomer. We put it on a, a little bucket of ice to cool it down just so it shuts down its metabolism. And then we prepare the, the blood vessels to be implanted into the next person. And it's we're right next to each other. Sean's in, Dr. Coomer's in one room, and I'm across the hall in the other room. And we take the donor back, usually the first case in the morning. And then um, as soon as that's going well, we'll get the kidney and get the patient ready. And So we're we literally wheeling we're it We're just to pushing one, it right across the hallway right there. Right across the hallway. And now it's into your OR. Yep. It's in your hands. And we plug it in. And <laughs> usually it's like a baby boy. It starts peeing right on us. and <laughs> That's right. It's kind of... I think Cliff or uh, one of those guys has a picture of the ure ureter just making urine right on the table. And that's a good sign. It's a great sign when we see that. It's one of the most amazing things after doing surgery for 20 years to see the thing make urine almost immediately is pretty satisfactory. I bet. And that leads me to my next question, because, Dan, once you received your kidney, how soon after did you start feeling better? Because I know, Dr. Schmidt, we say it's almost, I mean, within, could be within hours, within a couple of days, you, you, you're you physically starting to feel better, right? Yeah, we'll hear what he says, but most people with kidney failure, it's so insidious. Right. They don't know how tired or how run down they feel, and all of a sudden, they feel better, and it's uh, almost like a light switch. Right, how Dan. Fast they feel better. When did the light switch turn on for you? And so, so yes, with my current condition, since it was a slow progressing, um, and then with the fact that I didn't have to uh, be on dialysis um, before this transplant, it probably took me a little bit um, uh, after, like I was starting to recover from surgery, about, about a little bit more, less than a month. And then I, that's when I started realizing that since it was a slow progression, how much energy I had lost. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't realize that until, you know, again, I started feeling better. I could start moving around again after the uh the surgery and then i was like oh i i can i can really keep going and i didn't realize i thought like two o'clock in the afternoon you were supposed to you know really want a nap <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> right and uh and so you know now I, I do feel you know especially now like you know several years after i mean i i feel you know, very very alive i guess in terms of you know the amount of energy that i have and and i can just you know before things that you know, I would maybe wear me down and I just didn't realize it. I could just, you know, keep going and not even realize that, you know, I you know, plowed through it all. Yeah, we call him the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> Good. Well, and we know this transform that's a transformation physically, but emotionally, Katie, what has this been like to just kind of watch this full circle moment from a, you know, one of your best friends in high school? Um, and then, Steffi, I'm going to ask you your sa the same question to you. But, Katie, what's it like to just watch this all come together? Well, it has definitely been an emotional roller coaster. Um, from just the fear and worry, kind of like what Dr. Schmidt said about, you know, when we first made our Facebook post, not knowing if he was going to be able to get a transplant and how quickly, if he was going to end up on dialysis, what that time would look like, um, to then the surprise and awe of Stephanie being willing to step up and joy of her being a match to then the anxiety of surgery, to have two people that I love so much going through surgery at the same time was definitely uh, a moment of anxiety, but KU Med was incredible. And then um, now the overwhelming happiness of not only being able to reconnect and share our lives with Stephanie, like that has just been the icing on the cake of all of this is being able to stay friends and, and develop that friendship with her but also just the the time with my husband, like being able to have more time to do the things we love to do, to travel. And exactly what Dan said, you know, I remember a month before his transplant, he would have to come inside and take naps and stuff after different activities outside. And now just to be able to be like, hey, let's go. And, you know, it's wonderful. It, the, the fact that I have given, I've got more time with my husband is incredible. But not only did Stephanie give Dan a life-saving gift, she gave all of us, all of us who love Dan and know Dan, we now get the opportunity to have him for more time. And that's, that's the best part. Stephanie, you're down to one kidney. How are you feeling? I feel great. I mean, listen to these guys. Who wouldn't want to give them? I'll give you my other kidney. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need it. One's great. <laughs> Stephanie, it's what's been this very... been like for you? 
uh, at just a, a, an incredibly emotionally overwhelming and rewarding process. I physically, uh, it sounds kind of crazy to say, but it was pretty easy. Uh, so I was in the hospital for a couple of nights. Surgery was December 18th. I was home the 21st and I went back to work uh, at the first of the year. So I was back to running and doing all the normal things six weeks out and uh, just kind of continued that. And physically it's been wonderful and emotionally, it's just hard to even quantify what a gift I feel. I feel like I've been given so much more than I gave uh, in the kidney every day. It's just such a, such a wonderful feeling. Well, you and your one kidney went on quite a journey recently. You climbed a mountain, certainly for this experience with, with Dan and Katie, and then you quite literally climbed the mountain, Mount Kilimanjaro. You did this on World Kidney Day. Here is you and what, 21 other kidney donors all trekked up the mountain and you summited on World Kidney Day. Tell us about that experience. Uh, so just uh, difficult, physically the hardest thing <laughs> I've done for sure, uh, but just just an incredible, uh, incredible experience, a wonderful time. I had never been around so many kidney donors before, so it was fun to have that bond. And uh, it was something we really wanted to take on to show everyone, you know, not only can you have a normal life after you donate a kidney, but you could do all kinds of crazy physical challenges like climb Kilimanjaro. Uh, so it was really uh, fulfilling and rewarding to be able to share that experience with a group of people who've already shared kind of a unique sort of experience together. Dr. Schmidt, she's one of those people that like makes us all look like we just don't quite do enough. <laughs> right? I know. I was thinking, I feel like I take a, need to take a nap every couple of days. Right. In the of the I know. We feel like big slackers now. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Stephanie. Uh, Dan, what are you most looking forward to getting back to doing? What weren't you doing before that now you feel like you can really get out there and do? And we're not expecting you to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, but you know. <laughs> Well, I mean, even just simple things of like being able to exercise without making it feel, you know, difficult. Um, you know, there's, you know, like a lot of little hobbies that I have, you know, with you know, kind of work on cars and stuff like that, you know, just being able to do stuff like that, be able to, you know, as Katie mentioned, travel, uh, we both like to experience new things and, and to be able to continue to do that without, you know, any type of worries of, of you know, my health and, you um, you know, like with if I had to go on dialysis, you know, the time needed for all that and everything, you just, we just don't have that. You get all this time back. Um, and it's it's just kind of amazing to be able to to know that you have that available. <laughs> yeah, changes your perspective. Uh, Dr. Schmidt, how do, how do you think stories like this, you know, just us talking to these three people, um, Stephanie climbing up a mountain, how does that really help transplantation? How does it help really raise awareness? Do stories like this really, you know, kind of, help move the needle and get people to ask more questions about what it really means to be a living kidney donor. Yeah, I think, you know, from a personal perspective, I think it helps us in the transplant center to do our job every day because sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's exhausting. But then when we see the end result of what we do, it's really rewarding and allows us to just keep pushing forward. I think when the public sees this, I think people who may have been willing or, or, or questioning donation suddenly see that, wow, you can really donate and still have a normal life and help somebody, somebody else out. And then from patient's standpoint, I think they see that, you know, asking for help is one of the hardest things to do. So posting on Facebook or social media and being your own advocate really can help you. And then it's not selfish to do that because you're actually allowing people who love you to be there longer so you know you're going to live longer if you have a transplant or versus not having a transplant so i think it's so helpful to see stuff like this well and you you just said it and i think stephanie we talked about this before you know you were honored to be able to do this i think you know you talk about it being such a big ask and such a big give as we always say but um to be able to to give of yourself you felt that to really be the gift right Absolutely. I Like I said, I feel like I've gotten so much more out of it. It was so emotionally moving and rewarding and continues to be uh, to see how well Dan is doing. I uh, just, I couldn't, I, I feel like it's one of the greatest things I've ever done. And all in honor of your father. Yes, that was a heavy emotional day. Yeah, we were able to summit on the anniversary. Again, we were able to summit on the anniversary of his passing. So uh, incredibly emotional to be able to do that to honor kidney patients like Dan and also uh, in memory of my dad too. So.
So pretty and cool. If we, if we could pull the video up, I don't know, if guys, if we could pull the video up of them summiting. But what was that like? Tell us what that felt like. I mean, health-wise, I know you said you, you had extra health uh, people along with you and uh, people kind of watching you guys going up that mountain. But what was it like to finally get there? And how long did it take you to get up there? Exhausting. Uh, so it took about eight and a half hours. So you leave in the middle of the night. We started uh, the summit at 11.30 p.m. and got there just before 8 a.m. So uh, you're summiting in the cover of darkness. It's a three-mile summit from base camp, and it's 4,500 vert vertical feet of gain. So basically straight up uh, through the dark with the wind blowing and very cold weather. And uh, it was the hardest night <laughs> of my life. Uh, but very, I'm being able to see the sunrise at the top of Kilimanjaro, you can kind of see the curvature of the earth. You're surrounded by glaciers. It feels otherworldly. It was really uh, just such an incredible moment. 19,000 feet straight up. How long were you on the mountain total? How many days? Eight days. Eight days. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, we're glad you're back down safely. I was glad to get that call or that text from you that said you were home <laughs> and back down. Uh, Dr. Schmidt, do people register uh, to do this, they, they, this seems like kind of almost the perfect story where somebody connected on Facebook, but if somebody is listening to this and wants to become a kidney donor, wants to be put on a list to see if they're a match, what kind of questions should they ask themselves? What do they need to do? Where do they start? We have a, a website you can link to at our hospital to uh, become a living kidney donor. Obviously, the, you know, there's a place to sign up for being a donor after you pass. That's on, you know, the DMV or on donor.org, I believe, to register online. But I think if you want to become a living donor kidney to help somebody on the list, you just have to be really otherwise healthy, no hypertension or um, problems with diabetes. We don't want to take a kidney out of somebody who will need to in the future. So it's most mostly healthy people can be kidney donors. Okay, so I'm not saying that you're old or that you've been doing this a long time, <laughs> but you have done quite a few of these procedures. Just, I have to ask you, I'm not gonna try to get you super emotional, but what is it like for you to um, to go in and, and sit by the bedside after somebody comes out, like somebody like Dan, or to be able to, to see these type of stories? Emotionally, what's that like for you as a physician and um, a healthcare provider? I think it's, it's one of the, my most favorite procedures you know we have people who we can help and then we have people who we can change their life and the kidney transplants one of those operations dr coomer he you know he, he's operating on somebody the donor who's otherwise healthy that's the only person in the hospital who doesn't need to be there to, that day and so he's super stressed that's why he's lost all his hair yep. and <laughs> And then when I'm putting the kidney in, it's the one shot, it's the, you know, if anything goes wrong, it's a disaster. So we have a lot of uh, no room for error, but when it goes well, it goes really well. And patients usually do really great. And it's nice to see. You really, usually very good outcomes. Yeah, I mean, that's nice. Uh, that we work hard to have good outcomes, but it's, you know, we feel like we're operating without a net sometimes, but, you know, patients get rewarded. Yeah, it's nice getting their quality of life back. I want to get to some community questions because they have um, some good ones this morning. Um, Joe Ellen is curious, just in this age of COVID, what has changed for the process? Anything changed, uh, Dr. Schmidt? Uh, and certainly are, have we turned a quarter and things getting back to normal in your department? I think we've become way more efficient, you know, with telehealth and screening before they get to the hospital. We do a lot of the education now by Zoom or uh, Microsoft Teams. So I think we've become way more efficient with how we evaluate patients, evaluate donors, um, and I th uh, infection control has become that much better. So I think COVID has really just made us more efficient. Made you better. Yeah. They couldn't stop you. You can't, you can't beat it, just join <laughs> it. Right. Um, exactly. So our, uh, Jean wants to know, are kidney donors and recipient, recipients considered immunocompromised when it comes to COVID? The donors, no, but the recipients, yes. You know, um, patients who ha are on immunosuppression uh, are definitely at risk for COVID. So um, the vaccines are very important for people who have had a transplant and especially people who are, uh, have kidney failure on dialysis, they're immunosuppressed. So even if they're not going to get a transplant or waiting for a transplant, um, the vaccine is very important. Dan, question. How, how did you handle COVID during this time? Just staying extra safe? Yeah. And, uh, you know, just being very cautious. 
mm -hmm. about you know everything you know with the, you know we wore our mask and everything and we you know made sure that um, especially when the the first hit and kind of spread across everything you know we did our our quarantine and luckily we was able to you know for work purposes be able to you know work at home but yeah we were just pretty much cautious about everything we kind of you know scaled back you know any like traveling and everything because we took it pretty serious you know I didn't want to you know somehow you know end up um you know with it that caused complications um especially you know with such a great gift that you know stephanie gave me i wasn't going to try to compromise that so we definitely took it very easy and um you know very cautious about with everything yeah stephanie said i think as she was being rolled back take good care of my kidney so <laughs> good work <laughs> so let me ask you this um Dr. Schmidt, I'm, Isaac wants to know, as far as the kidney donor, so as far as Stephanie goes, how does the remaining kidney compensate for the absent of the other? The other kidney um, gets a little bigger, at hypertrophy some, and um, thank goodness uh, we as humans have a lot of extra reserve when it comes to kidney function. So um, the majority of people who lose a kidney being a donor never go on to have any kidney problems. So. The one kidney, the remaining kidney gets a little bit bigger and it still does its job because we have plenty of reserves. That's right. So we kind of, I mean, when people say you only really need one kidney, is that somewhat true? The unless majority, you, Unless yeah. you end up needing Unless it. you have diabetes, right. hypertension, other problems. Unfortunately, you've seen the population of the United States. It's not the healthiest population. Right. So you, most people don't need it, but there are a lot who need two kidneys. So Isaac has a question, Have and you, you touched on this earlier, have any kidney donors turned around and then had to receive a transplant themselves to replace the one that they lost. That's, of course, why they go through such heavy yeah. health screenings to make sure that won't happen, but I'm sure it has. There are very few people who go on to need a kidney. Um, we haven't had any here at our center, but the organ network who does controls donation and transplant allows those patients who had given a kidney to get very high priority. So if they would have to be put on a list, they would get the top priority. I wanna to get to some final thoughts this morning, uh, but I do wanna ask uh, uh, Dan, Katie, and Stephanie, just you, what are you both looking forward to? I think we have some photos of, of, of you all together and spending some time together over the last four years, but um, kind of where does this, what does this bond mean for the future? <laughs> um, I mean, I think for us, it's just, Again, Stephanie and I were very close in high school, so it's just so wonderful and awesome that we are able to share our lives again with her. And uh, I think just making memories together, like, as I said, one of our biggest things has been the fact that we have more time and mm -hmm. we've been given more time to make these memories. So to get that opportunity to have Stephanie included in that and uh, Stephanie's husband, and it's just wonderful. It really is so, so amazing. She's a pretty cool person to hang out with. Aww. <laughs> yeah, she is cool. She got me up at what time? 6.30 in the morning to go walking to get prepped for your, we did a story where we had to get prepped for your, um, you're prepping for your, you know, your hike up the mountain. And I was out in like nine degree weather. I lasted, I don't know, eight minutes, eight minutes. And then I ran back to my car and then sent you on your way to go out in it for eight hours. So yeah, we know who the tough one is here. Uh, Stephanie, what's your message though? I wanna get some final thoughts from you about what is your message to people who might, might have questions? I mean, we see you doing so well. You're such a, a good model for, for this, but what do you want people to know if, if they, they wanna take a chance like you did and, and go for it and help another person and save a life? Absolutely. I would love uh, for folks to know that it is maybe not as scary as it might initially seem, that it's a, an overwhelmingly positive process. It is not as physically demanding as you might imagine. Uh, find out information about it. Call KU. They were absolutely fantastic for me. Get your questions answered and pursue it. And, and as you know, hopefully we've shown from this climb to Kilimanjaro, you can donate a kidney and turn around and do all of the things that you wanted to do and more uh, with your life. It can be just as full, even and really, frankly, even more full uh, because you've had this kidney donation experience. Katie and Dan, your final thoughts? I mean, I think from this whole experience of, uh, of um, Stephanie climbing uh, with along with a group of other, you know, like donors, I think it's just really amazing. And I really hope it, it again, inspires a lot of other people um, so many questions, you know, uh, were, you know, that I, uh, that were asked of me, like pre and post transplant, um, people just didn't realize, 
you know, there was uh, they didn't realize they could even donate. They they thought they could they had to have both kidneys. You know, they didn't even realize they could live off one. And so I think just having this you know experience that Stephanie done, and then being able to get the word out, just you know, let other people know that it's it's really a, a easy experience if you're able to do so, and it provides so much for the recipient. Um, and you know it. As Stephanie kind of mentioned earlier, it was you know kind of a very easy, and for for me, I thought it was a very boring process. But that's that's just something that I don't think everyone gets to experience when they get a transplant. And I I would love to see more of just a very easy, simple experience um, to go through because it really makes it you know all, much more worth it. Absolutely, Katie. I love, I, you know, we hear these stories of, you know, social media and social media can, can bring on some negative consequences, but this is one of those ones where you took a chance and, and really turned it into something really special. Um, and I just love the story about just how um, it's not always easy to ask for help. What do you want people to know about that it's okay to ask for help because people like Stephanie are out there who, who actually want to? Yeah. I, I think you hit it on the head. Like it's just one of those things where you you don't want to be able, you don't want to be in a position where you're taking away someone else's chance to do something amazing. And so for us, it, I'm so grateful that we made a Facebook post and that we let people know kind of just even what was happening in our lives, you know, just so that people could help us. However, and it wasn't just Stephanie being able to give a, do a kidney. It was so much more of people being able to keep us in their thoughts and prayers and provide us food and help us out. And so there was so many other ways people could help us, but that was the biggest, like it was, we just needed people to know. And so it's okay to ask for help. Absolutely. Well, guys, thank you so much for sharing your story. It's been fun getting to know all of you. Please stay in touch and stay well. And um, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Final thoughts from you. What do you want everyone to know? Just first of all, about just staying healthy, keeping our kidneys healthy, and about living donation. Yeah, I mean, uh, we have, I think, almost 350, 400 people on our kidney transplant list right now. And nationwide, I believe there's almost 50,000 yeah. people on a kidney list. And not everybody has a happy ending. So if there are people that are willing to donate, um, there are lots of people who need a kidney. And it's safe, and um, it, you can have a great reward by doing it. So I think this kind of story makes awareness so much right at the front forefront, and we need kidneys. And just asking questions about it. Yeah. Picking up the phone doesn't mean you're giving away your kidney. It's just no. means you're, you're taking that first step down the journey yeah. to see if it's something for you. It's not as scary as it seems, as we see, but it's still the first step is usually the hardest. And once you make that first step, it, it usually isn't as scary as you think it's going to be. Thanks for sitting in with me today. Always good to see you. Yeah, thanks for having us. All right, Dr. Hawkinson, yeah. didn't mean to leave you out today. We just had no, kind of a cool story, good right? story, interesting. I think it's mm -hmm. extremely important, you know. We know that organ donation is a uh, life-saving uh, gift you can give someone, is a quality of life-saving gift you can give someone. So we saw how to do it uh, as a living donor, but also remember when you go to renew your license or go to the DMV, please sign up to be an organ donor. So just sure. kind of reinforce those messages. Yeah, good, good reminder there. Thanks so much. All right, March 30th is National Doctors' Day, and here's a way to say thank you to all healthcare workers. Right there on your screen is a QR code so that you can share your gratitude. Just open the camera on your phone, hover over that QR code, and it's going to take you to email, and you can send a note or a 30-second video that we can then share right here on air. So send those in. We'd love to see them. Coming up at 10 a.m., a brand new episode of All Things Heart, hosted by my friend Alexis Del Cid, who is joining us right now this morning. Good morning. Nice to see you. We have such a great topic, Jess, because it's one I think that all of us can relate to because we've all been there. You're sitting on the couch, you're eating those chips or donut holes or cookies or gummy worms. Pick your poison, right? You know you need to stop, but you just can't, and it's a hopeless feeling. Would you be surprised to learn that scientists say food companies can specifically engineer their junk foods to override your brain's natural ability to tell you to stop eating? And it can have devastating effects on your heart. And our kids are incredibly vulnerable to this. It's like Oreo cookies, you know, they just, and ice cream. They, they just can't say no, and they love, love, love donuts. Okay, so there's a name for what's happening. Those foods have triggered what's widely known as the bliss point in your brain. So right here at 10 a.m., please join us with the discussion and bring your questions for our experts. We're gonna be talking to a cardiologist and a clinical psychologist about the science behind the bliss point 
and what that's doing to our bodies and our brains, how it all affects our hearts as well. It's all connected. That's this morning at 10 a.m. Oh, that's going to be a good one, Alexis. Mm -hmm. It's such oh. a fascinating topic. Yes. All right. I'm going to be watching. Thanks. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today right here. Uh, don't forget, you can catch our show anytime by going back to Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Coming up tomorrow, age is just a number, right? Wrong. The older you get, the slower we get. Well, not maybe for everyone, but for those not as active as we age, it could lead to an early death. And COVID certainly isn't helping matters much. The steps you can take to ward off dementia, stay active and healthy, mind, body, and soul as we age. That's tomorrow at 8 o'clock. Everyone, have a great Thursday. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcasts. Now everywhere podcasts are available.